What's up, sports fans? The NBA has been back for less than a month, and we've already gotten a ridiculous amount of absolutely insane finishes filled with highlights, great tactics, incredible execution, and, well, let's just say I'll be asking you, can you hear me shaking my head? Perhaps it was the Halloween vibes, but the Clippers and Rockets gave us a memorable one, and it won't be the first time we'll see LA needing some miracles deep in the fourth. Down three, 43 seconds left. Let's see what Ty Lue drew up out of the timeout. Absolutely nothing fancy. Paul George with the ISO pull-up. Notice how he uses it through the legs to get it to his left hand. Usually a better choice for a pull-up for righties. And check how he swings the ball up the left side of his body to protect it from a strip attempt by the defense. And that's about as good a contest as you're gonna see. We've got Bomber pumping the fists and counting his money. There's really not enough time for a two for one by the Rockets, so they bring it up into inverted pistol with the handoff to Eric Gordon, followed by the ball screen. Great idea, until Paul George literally plays hide and seek behind the big man before tricking and treating his way to the ball. Gordon tried to split the defenders, but there's George playing peekaboo to knock it away. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as they clear the entire side for PG to go to work. Unclear why the Rockets put the much shorter Eric Gordon on him. Even more unclear why a second defender didn't come running over with the poor spacing the Clippers had on the weak side. But it doesn't matter. The incredibly difficult right-left step back to PG's right, the hardest shot for any right-hander, and the net just rips. Now, Balmer is worried about his ears, and he should be. Plenty of time for the Rockets, and though the screen for Gordon didn't work on the good switch by Batum, we've got a one-on-one -on -one matchup between the two old guys. Rockets fans, avert your eyes as Gordon tries the off-foot layup, which required a little bit of a double pump for power, but it didn't generate quite enough as that ball just bounces off the rim like a scared cat off a of witch's broom and Balmer gives us this. But let's move on to a wild one in Cleveland where the Cavs are becoming one of the top teams in the East. The Cavs had a matchup problem, unclear why they wanted Mobley to guard Horford and Jared Allen on Brown. This means there's no Allen rim protection as Levert tries to cheat and blow up the handoff from Smart to Tatum, leaving a straight line drive and too much distance for Allen to cover to get there. The Celtics have to foul to get the ball back, Grant Williams screaming at his coach to challenge this call, and you know what? He might have had a point. And fouling in this situation is going to come back later, so stick around. That leads to this inspired sideline out of bounds play. The Cavs completely misread this alignment. Clearly, the Celtics want to get Tatum a head start into a catch going to the hoop, so it makes no sense that they have Dean Wade glued to him in the backcourt. It also makes no sense to put Jared Allen on the ball when they've got an equally long and good defender out there in Mobley. Love the blind pig action to get the slick bounce pass from Smart to Tatum. Because Allen had to guard Grant Williams, he's again late protecting the rim, and Tatum just lets him have it. Some anger from Jason wanting a foul, but the replay shows there wasn't enough contact with the body to merit a whistle. And the contact of the hand comes after the ball's already in the hoop, so play on. I like the idea behind this last shot by Cleveland, but you have to know the Celtics will switch any kind of screening action. So why do they use Tatum's man setting the ghost screen? You'd want Mitchell to attack the slower Horford, or the less long-armed Grant Williams. Oh, he missed the open Garland for the shot too, and this game went to overtime. Down one, the Celtics try the same play they used in regulation, and the Cavs try to defend it the same way. But with only 2.3 seconds left, the Celtics don't really have time to cut Tatum behind Brown for a handoff, and so they get a decent shot, but Brown can't hit it over Wade. I'm sure we'll see some more great games between these two teams, but Tatum is going to have to take care of his ball handling if they want to win. That's why you must get Manscaped's performance package. It's vital to keep things tidy on your face and in your more sensitive areas. And their lawnmower 4.0 can take care of both. It's cordless and waterproof, so use it in the shower and you won't piss off your wife. But Manscaped's performance package has tons more. Their weed whacker defends you all up in your face, sending those annoying nose and ear hairs back into the stands. And the Crop Reviver has cool aloe vera to keep your balls dishing and swishing. Unfortunately for Embiid, he had the Celtics hounding him into fumbling his balls a whopping six times. So avoid those pesky defenders in your life. Instead, use my code BBALL to save 20% off your order. But I'll also call Manscaped and tell them to give you two free gifts for a limited time. The Shed Travel Bag and Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. I wear these all the time, and I wouldn't trust anyone else next to my performance package. So click on the link below, use my code BBALL, and your balls will feel a lot better than Sacramento's, considering how often the Kings appear in this video. So let's talk about their game against the Heat first. 26 lead changes, 11 ties, 
This game has been ridiculous and it gets even more so from here. Up to the Heat are pursuing like crazy and great rotations to stop the penetration, but Gabe Vincent closes out poorly, allowing Monk into the middle. Bam has no choice but to rotate over and now Sabonis gets two free throws to tie the game. This is a tough situation for the Kings, on the road, plenty of time for the Heat, and here we go! Of course, they'll turn to Tyler Hero, who already has 10 points in this fourth quarter. The only question is, how much help will the offense give him to get open? The answer? Not much. Just force a switch and let him go to work out top on Terrence Davis. Perfect defense to force him into a pump fake, but Hero hits it anyway! Of course, he traveled his butt off on this one. He gathers and lands in the jump stop. He's legally allowed to lift one of his feet up and put it back down. That's the right foot, making the left foot his pivot. He illegally lifts that foot up and puts it back down. Refs blew a big one, folks. And then matters get worse when they call an offensive foul on Sabonis here. Bam Adebayo is grabbing his jersey, then he's not in any type of legal guarding position as he crashes into the shooting player, who's simply elevating into a last second shot. This ends the game, and Kings fans, I feel ya. Let's go to Phoenix, where this broken play lets Nurkic tee it up and give the Trailblazers a one-point lead. Great to see Keon Johnson prevent the Suns from rolling the ball up and saving precious seconds. Was this switch too easy? Probably. And it left Nurkic alone on an island in the sun. Watch Booker use that same through the legs dribble to his left hand in order to go to the pull-up. I also like the little gallop he used for an extra few inches of space before letting it fly over the 7-footer. Now it's the Blazers' turn to potentially get a 2-for-1 if they go extremely quick. Bridges wants to prevent the pass to the corner, but that puts him woefully out of position when they go to the handoff back to his man coming from out of bounds. Aiden does his job on the switch, but Nurkic just clears all the shorties out of there and gets the lead back for Portland. Suns have a lot of experience, they don't need to take a timeout I guess, but we all remember how much Booker hates double teams, right? The Blazers correctly double off of Bridges' man, and instead of getting it in the hands of the wide open CP3 on the wing, Booker gets it to Bridges, who promptly travels in a clearly uncomfortable situation for him. But did he travel? Despite its awkwardness, it looks like he gathers here with the right foot down, then jump stops. In this scenario, he is allowed to pivot if he wants to. He's thereby also allowed to lift that pivot foot in the air so long as he shoots it before it comes back down. This is what happens, yet the refs call it a travel, setting up the sweet, sweet irony of this play. Blazers run an old school stack on the free throw line. They look for the lob, which is way off target if they wanted to get an alley hoop. But Aiden jumps out of the way, giving Jeremy Grant a wide open 15 footer for the game. But Grant controls the ball with his left foot on the ground, meaning his right foot becomes the pivot foot. He then proceeds to lift that one up, puts it back down before jumping into the shot. And this one is the travel the refs needed to call, but didn't. At least Kings fans got something to cheer about the next night, even if you're not going to believe how this one ended. In Orlando, Suggs cuts the lead to two with under 12 seconds left. All the Kings need to do is get it in balance and basically wait for the foul. But they make a massive mistake throwing it into the corner and still has a chance to make a relatively easy pass to Trey Lyles but throws it behind him and whoa boy, this game is tied. But De'Aaron Fox isn't phased. Despite not having any timeouts left and not a lot of pressure since the game was tied, he just casually pulls from the logo. Ask yourself why the defense wasn't closer to him. There wasn't really enough time for him to get all the way to the rim, so don't let him line this one up, but it drops through and finally the Kings can party it up. And that brings us to two more insane games from last night, so hold on to your butts. We're back in Miami, and it's our old friends the Blazers again. With this much time left, you might see the defense try to trap aggressively to get a steal before fouling, but inexplicably they don't do this. So now we've got the classic foul up by three scenario, but Chauncey apparently didn't tell his guys to do so, basically letting Strews tie the game from the corner over Simons. Can you hear me shaking my head? When you've got Dame on your team, you don't need to call your last time out here and the Heat defense allow him to dribble full speed to the three-point line, forcing Lowry to help one pass away and stop a layup attempt. But that leaves Josh Hart all by himself in the corner to rise up, let it fly, and splash it down for the win just before the buzzer sounds. You think the Heat would have liked a couple more seconds on the clock? And that gets us to the Clippers versus the Cavs. It was the last game of the night. You might have been asleep by the end, especially after Cleveland took a 13-point lead with five minutes left. 
but the Clippers put the absolute clamps down on the Cavs offense. Paul George comes out of the timeout with an and one, and it got us to this point. With a shot clock difference, the Cavs need only play good defense, and they'll have plenty of time to mount an attack even without a timeout. But then they appear to get into foul mode with some ultra-aggressive pressure on the ball, and Mobley just comes up and blocks Morris for an obvious foul. Mitchell is upset, and rightfully so. So now the Clippers are up three, but generally you don't take the foul until it's under 10 seconds. However, since the Cavs don't have any timeouts left, perhaps this is okay. The point certainly becomes moot when Garland misses the first free throw. I love that the Clippers inbounded the backcourt to let the clock run for a couple of extra seconds. Ballmer is clearly concerned, and he should be, as Paul George gets way too close to the shooter and fouls him up top to keep the Cavs in this game. Now, this one is a typical high five play that is supposed to not be called by the refs. Although, let's admit it, the refs have been woefully inconsistent with this one already this season and we've barely played 10 games. Mitchell tries to catch the Clippers off guard with the intentional miss of the third free throw and he got tantalizingly close but no cigar. And this brings us to another intentional miss situation, but I kind of feel like there's a wee bit too much time left to do this. Normally, you'll see it done with about 0.9 seconds left or something. You make both, you eliminate the chance of losing altogether. But you're giving a chance to the only guy in the entire NBA who is accurate from full court. And my oh my does Kevin Love give this one a serious ride, but it just misses and that wraps up a ridiculous week in the NBA where we're getting some of the most insane finishes to games already. Which makes me wonder, what are we going to see the rest of the season?